So everyone, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. My name is Rachel Burson, and I'm with the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. One of the roles that I have there is to serve as the co-director of the RI Summer Scholar Program. Today, we're going to hear directly from some of the scholars from the 2021, so this past year, this was our second year that we were virtual with RIS, and we're going to hear about some of their research and their experiences. You'll also have an opportunity to directly ask questions, um, and we will hear from the scholars some of their advice on um, getting started in robotics, but also, you know, what are some of the possibilities and how to, to explore that. So I really want to thank everyone for joining us today and let's get started with a little bit about the Robotics Institute Summer Scholar Program and um, what that program is. Okay. So we've got many friends on the call and on YouTube here, and, and um, I'd like to share a little bit about what the Summer Scholar Program is and why Carnegie Mellon University is so well known for robotics. The Institute um, is home to actually the world's first academic department in robotics. The Robotics Institute was started in 1979 and it started as a research institute. And it's been such an important part of Carnegie Mellon and its overall atmosphere there that it's, it's, it's situated within the School of Computer Science and it's been part of the city and it's been really leading um, so many aspects of um, robotics and education, especially around autonomous vehicles. We know that um, autonomous vehicles are um, really making the headlines so often and many of these companies are located here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So what unites us all? So what is the Summer Scholar Program? The Robotics Institute is the world's largest university affiliated robotics research group. And we have the opportunity to bring students from around the world, across the state and across the city um, to come and join us here to do research. And this is one of the things that unifies us is that we really love robotics. We love the potential and the impact that it can have. So we've created a program that allows students from many different backgrounds to come here for a experience that is really intensive during the summer where we go through and we have three parts to that guided research professional development and then this nurturing environment and these connections it's really the connections and the access there that goes on to open doors for years to come so RIS is open to both US and international students, students studying in the United States and students studying at home universities around the world. We've hosted students from more than 50 home countries and they've enriched our experience each summer. And th there's, a, there's several threads that, that really bring us together. And that is, you know, that we're engaging in and really trying to explore what are the possibilities in robotics. And this is an exciting place to be because not only is the department so large and it has so many different application areas and research groups that are doing robotics, we're also home to the National Robotics Engineering Center. And that is a really exciting So RIS has become part of the Carnegie Mellon University experience. 
it's intentionally very supportive and nurturing. We do a lot of when we can, this is our second summer where we've been remote. We do a lot of um, hands-on experiences together. We build the community. As I look across these pictures that you're gonna see in a few minutes, these students are still part of our community. They're connected in, they're researchers now, they're PhD students. And um, RIS is not only about coming to Carnegie Mellon, but it's connecting across the world. So we see students here from Harvard and Stanford and um, Georgia Tech and other universities as well. Our students are engaged in our mission as well, which is sharing our passion for robotics. So we welcome teachers and students throughout the summer when we're in person, and we teach and share and talk about the robotics that we're working on. RIS is really here to set a foundation, and we're working on creating opportunities for students to present and share their research. And we create some intentional opportunities that are for them to showcase their work. So we are so hopeful to be back in person so we can do some of the things that we love the most, um, to come together and celebrate as a community, to um, create drone um, competitions, to do everything. But one thing is certain is that the Carnegie Mellon University um, and our colleagues are here to continue to support and engage and our students go on to really do amazing things and attend top graduate programs around the world. And it's because of this, RIS is a community at its heart and it's the de dedicated faculty, graduates and staff and the alumni that really make a difference. So our students go on to innovate, to lead. Um, and this is just the first step, hopefully together. So over the course of the next hour, we're gonna explore through the eyes of the scholars um, who know the program the best. What is the Summer Scholar Program? And um, we're gonna hear more about their research. So we have asked um, students to come and to share their research with us and their experience so that um, you can learn about the Summer Scholar um, Program so that you can maybe join us here in a future summer. We would love love to have the opportunity for you to connect to our research, to connect to um, different opportunities. So I'm going to um, introduce and what I'm going to be doing is I'm here to facilitate. I'll also be diving in and helping all of those that are joining us on um, YouTube as well to ask questions, to just explore this opportunity a little bit. So um, over the next half hour, we're going to get some presentations and we're going to hear directly from um, the scholars themselves. So I would like to um, invite each of the students um, that have been with us here this summer, um, virtually, unfortunately not in person, um, to introduce themselves and then each of them will do a short research presentation um, and talk about their journey a little bit and then we're going to open it up for question and answer. I'm going to in the very beginning introduce Arnab Day who worked with the Autumn Lab at Carnegie Mellon University. Arnab, may I ask you to say hello? Of course. Hello everyone. My name is Arnab. Um, I'll try to keep my presentation interesting and engaging, and you can let me know if I do a good job or not. <laughs> um, so while I share my screen, I'll basically say a few quick things about me. Okay. Um, I'm a rising sophomore at Georgia Tech, and this is my first time with RIS, and I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here. That much I can say for sure. Um, is my screen visible? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Great. Um, so once again, my name is Arnab, and today I'll be presenting a little bit about my research on the weekly supervised classification of respiratory rate vital sign alerts as real or artifact. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but if you've ever been to a hospital or seen in movies or TV shows, those vital sign monitors that have all the beeping and the EKG and all that waveform stuff, well, sometimes when those metrics that, uh, that they're measuring, when they exceed certain thresholds, they can beep and send a clinical alarm and alert uh, medical professionals. Now, it turns out that a large percent of these alarms are actually false. Now, this combined with the fact that healthcare professionals could be exposed to up to a thousand alarms per shift can really lead to alarm desensitization or alarm fatigue. 
in which the true instability of the patients are missed. Now, additionally, that loud constant beeping in the patient's ear can also lead to increased physiological stress, sleep disturbance, and unfortunately, even death, as the FDA has reported 500 alarm-related patient deaths in five years. Now, what's going on currently, or the level zero solution, as I like to say, is essentially that professionals have to manually analyze the validity of every alarm. And this is not really a solution because this is precisely what's contributing to alarm fatigue. And thus, it's very impractical. So let me introduce supervised learning. Supervised learning essentially can be boiled down to two parts, a classification problem or a regression problem. Because of my problem domain, I'm going to focus on the classification part. So this part right here. And essentially, you take your features, or which is the x variable, and then you basically have your y or your labels and values. And you take these features and you try to predict values for uh, your y. And how do you do this? Well, first you take, so a feature, for example, here is gene two and gene one. And then the y would be the label of whether it's a disease data point or a healthy data point. So you use known data to sort of train a model. And in this case, the model is basically this black line here that delineates the data. And you're training the model so it can predict your test value for a set of unknown X features. So prior research has looked at using supervised learning to uh, classify these alerts. Now it's a lot more practical and efficient, but if you recall, you do need that initial investment of time, money, and effort to acquire those ground truth labeled training data. So that doesn't come for free. You have to spend a lot of time on it. And so what we want to do is sort of combat that. And also we want more flexibility and efficiency. So like I said, acquiring those data points is expensive. And it's also potentially unnecessary. It also does not easily adapt to changing problem definitions. Now, what I mean by this is that if I, which I looked at respiratory rate alerts, if I want to now look at oxygen saturation alerts, then I'd have to, if I used a supervised pipeline, reacquire ground truth labels for the like from scratch. And so it's not very adaptable. So how can we circumvent this? Well, the solution is weak supervision or data programming. And this requires virtually zero label data and it's easily scalable and adaptable because it relies on multiple noisy heuristics for the weak supervisory signal instead of your hard-coded ground truth labels. So let me introduce what decision trees and random forests are really quickly. So decision trees you can see is this basically you have these nodes where you ask questions and then based on the answers you sort of go along these paths. And you can think of it as a classifier of sorts. In this example you have uh, ones and zeros, and you want to basically classify them as ones or zeros based on a set of features, which in this case are color and whether or not it's underlined or not. Now, decision trees are very useful, but they can they have a tendency to overfit on your training data. And so instead, you can look at random forests or basically a collection of these trees to sort of solve that problem. So forest, lots of trees, and a single tree, if you think of it as a person, can sort of be like a narrow mindset. It overfits to everything. So if you've only had experiences with birds that fly, you may think that all birds can fly. But a forest is a bit more nuanced. You have two or more heads, as, as it's known, is better than one, right? So what about penguins? If you've never experienced penguins, but maybe Billy has experienced penguins, and he can give you more perspective into that. They can't fly. And so I use random forest classifiers as my downstream classifier. So essentially, the pipeline of weak supervision works by having this domain expert that you go to. So in this case, a doctor or a nurse, and they'll provide you with some business rules that you then turn into labeling functions or actual code. And then these labeling functions basically vote on your training data. And then you give this votes to a generative model that outputs probabilistic labels that you can then use in conjunction with your alerts that you want to test on. And you feed this into a classifier and then it'll give you your prediction. So this is a bit complex and these are a lot of uh, details about the data that I that I used in my project. So I won't go over everything but just really quickly I used a uh, Philips monitor and looked at the data from ICU and SDU patients. Now you can see I looked at a variety of data so a bunch of numerics and waveform data. So the way these labeling functions work and you can see a sample one at the top is that they really thrive on these overlaps and conflicts between each other. So you can see these eight labeling functions that I used and you can focus on these overlaps and conflicts. 
the more overlap and conflict, the better for the prediction. And quickly, I just want to introduce what ROC curves are or receiver operating characteristic curves. Essentially, just quickly boil, boiling it down to a single concept is that it shows model performance for every classification threshold. So if you look at this, uh, this diagram down here, if you think of a threshold as sort of an arrow that just separates it between negative and positive, and you think of it as a sliding scale from zero to one, you could have your threshold all the way down here or over here or up here. And depending on where you set that threshold, uh, that depend that'll affect your actual false positive rate and true positive rate. And if you plot this and then you take the area under the curve, it can give you a gauge of how well your model does. So these are my results from my uh, project. I looked at four pipelines, so I have them all plotted here. Weak supervision is basically just the, uh, it's a, it uses a complex generative model and then the random force classifier at the end. The majority vote, uh, instead of using that complex generative model, it basically assigns the label that the majority of labeling functions vote on. And it also has a random force classifier at the end. The full supervision is just your standard supervised learning pipeline. And then the probability labels is actually just the output of the generative model and using the generative model as sort of a classifier. Uh, and just really quickly, for those of you that don't know, precision recall and F1 scores. You can think of precision, these are all sort of metrics on evaluating how well your model does. And so precision, you can think of as sort of how, so for example, in this case, if you just look at your positive elements that you predict, if you're predicting your positive elements, you can basically say or see how accurate are those positive elements. And that is basically your precision. As for recall, your recall is how much of the true positive, like the actual positive class are you covering with your guess for positives? And then your F1 score sort of balances this out by taking a harmonic mean. And so really quickly, my results. Interestingly enough, you can see the weak supervision pipeline actually does the best. And it has a higher F1 score than even supervised learning and higher accuracy than even supervised learning. And this is interesting because supervised learning has access to those ground truth labels and it was still outperformed by weak supervision. And eventually our models can be used to reduce alarm fatigue in the clinic, as well as review archive data. So sort of as like a double checker or like a fact checker for archive data. In the future, we want to look at classifying oxygen saturation alerts and a bunch of other stuff. I won't go into this because I think I'm going a bit over time here. Um, but yeah, I just wanna thank the risk sponsors and Rachel, Dr. Dolan and Jenny for making this whole opportunity possible as well as my wonderful mentors, Mononito and Dr. Dabrowski for their tremendous support throughout the summer. And it's done. Wonderful, thank you so much, Arnav. I'd like to all thank you for um, the presentation, for sharing your experience. There's so many great questions that are coming in and in, um, we'll, we'll, we'll go to those questions toward the end and we'll leave some time for that. I also wanted to mention that one of Arnav's um, Mentors was a former RIS alum that was with us twice. And so he's now a PhD student with the Robotics Institute. And that's what we believe in is this continuing journey and um, hopefully making linkages. And so I'm I'm so thankful that Mono was able to be one of your mentors this summer. That's that, that that's absolutely amazing. I wonder if I could invite Balam to share his um, research and his experience. I'm going next. So um, let me share my screen. Perfect, we see it, great. That's it. So, well, I'm, I'm, I'm Balam, I'm Balam Heredia, I'm from Mexico. I'm Mexican, I'm studying in the Instituto Tecnológico y de Estudios Superiores de Monterrey. And well, I, I was uh, the same as Manab. I was part of the RIS 2021 uh, cohort um, firm. So, and this is my like my most recent project that I was working with Melissa Orta Martinez, uh, the leader of the Social Habits Robotics and Education Lab. And this is called Agilov. It is an, an interactive algebra interface that allows students to model algebra functions. So, let's go into it. So what about hands-on learning? Uh, in this in the shared lab, what uh, the main uh, research focus is on 
putting robotics uh, into education. So it, it, in the case of our study, uh, even though mathematics uh, is considered an abstract subject, uh, research has shown that abstract mathematics concepts can be connected and grounded through bodily interaction. And there has been developed a, a wide range of dynamic and interactive environments to teach mathematics. Uh, research has also shown that a lack of interactivity experience um, with mathematics concepts leads to a gap in the experimentation for the students. And these studies uh, have suggested that involving mathematics uh, with kinesthetic lessons incorporating movement in the process of learning instead of just listening and visualization uh, have been associated with better student outcomes. So uh, now what we decided to create is, is an interactive algebra interface that we call AlgiGlobe. Uh, algebra in particular uh, is considered uh, the gateway to Astro Dot. In this work, uh, we present a software interface, the uh, algae globe, that allows the students to interact uh, and, ex and experiment uh, with algebra functions through movement. Uh, for the interaction between uh, the students and the movement, we use this pair of gloves. Um, the student or the user can uh, put on those gloves and then interact with the interface. Uh, basically, um, these are like the three colored uh, circles that goes into each of the three main fingertips that we decided to go. So the first part is, of course, to calibrate the interface because uh, this is based on, on, on color um, on color filtering, color HSV, that is hue saturation and value filter. So the first uh, step so is calibration. You input an image, you input, you can put uh, this a test, so you can put your, your, your glasses and then you can uh, calibrate which of the hue saturation values correspond to your um, color because of course we decided that this to be a scout so we don't know want this to be just fixed to some colors and that each student can put their own uh, kind of gloves and then put their own uh, colors of uh, circles and they can interact with the interface so you decide to go for these um, parameters uh, h and b uh, boundaries and then you can save your values in the calibration stage. So going now for the, for the whole of this work, uh, first we launch an interface. Uh, this interface, we initialize the interface. We initialize the, the particles that we that are some points that are going to be seen by the student. Uh, then you capture a frame. You process that frame by filtering by color, apply mass operations extract the center of the fingertips, and, and if there is any hand close, um, we are going to apply a, an input to the graded particle and simulate uh, the movement of the particle via Berlin integration, that is a mathematic uh, physics based simulation. Um, then uh, based on that, the result of this Berlin step simulation, we are going to render, render and update the interface, and there, there is that cycle that is going to be repeated. And if there is not any hand close, we are going to keep capturing frames. Uh, but, well, in the next uh, image, I think I can explain uh, a little bit more about how do we decide that a hand is closed. This is the line simulation that um, we decided to go. Um, these are the three fingertips that I need to go. The user can put their hand, and when they close their hand, you can move and interact with the, the function. What you see here at the right is the... Um, if, if your uh, equation, if this uh, fitted equation is a linear regression uh, uh, fitted, and this is uh, at the left uh, top is the target equation, uh, the user is, uh, is expected to match both of the equations when they uh, reach a, an, an error of 5%, uh, they can go to the next uh, stage and move with another uh, different proposed equation to so be matched. Uh, how do we decide uh, again? How we decide, decide that the hand is closed? That is based on a threshold. Um, it's three fingertips. Uh, if you feel it like abstractly, they create a triangle between uh, the three of them. So we decide to just go for the area that the triangle creates. We you decide a, a, a value of one and one thousand two hundred. When the eye of, of the pixel that they have in the hand is, is less than that um, number, then they can go and just interact with the function. The, 
we do not just uh, do a line simulation, but we also did a parabola simulation. And this can be like, like uh, going further and further to other uh, math functions. Just is this explaining, these are first uh, run of results. So the user, again, can uh, move and control the, the particles in the image. And, and then the, the red line is going to fit the, what you have in your particles to be this equation that you are going to be sitting here at the right. And then at the left, you are going to see another equation that is your target equation. And when you match those equations, you are going to see another exercise that is going to be proposed by your professor or is going to be automatically, automatically um, just generated. And yes, this, uh, this was my work. And what about the future work? We are going to uh, try to incorporate this interactive algebra interface into Classroom and evaluate uh, like results with the students. We are going to see if, if there is a, a significant difference between having this enterprise like in itself and to having um, also connected with paper uh, exercises and to see if there is a difference of that, of there is, the students are learning um, better than what they are doing just with paper-based uh, exams and practices. So another thing, uh, especially important for the uh, topics of our lab is uh, haptics. The haptics is basically those. Uh, we want the students to also feel the, the mathematical functions, just not to, um, yeah, you, you, we do not want just the student to uh, move the function, but also to feel the, the function that is haptics and that is a, a main research of uh, main research topic for our, our lab that is basically social haptics and robotic lab is the haptics word that is also important for the work of our lab. And yeah, I, I also want to thank the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University and Dr. John Dolan and Richard Wolsey for making this uh, effort to put the research 2021 in virtually and all kind of remotely experience for us. Thank you so much, Balam. The work that um, you participated in and, and the research that you did with um, Melissa is so exciting. It is really cutting edge and it's going to transform. It has the potential to transform um, education in the future. So we hope that there's an opportunity for you to continue your engagement with us and and. Um, we have a, a long-standing partnership with um, Tech de Monterey. So we're so thankful that um, we were all able to connect this summer. So wonderful. I would now like to in, invite Jasmine Jerry to share her research and her experience with RISC. Is my screen visible? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. So. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jasmine Jerry Alu. This summer, I worked on multimodal socially aware imitation learning for general aviation as a part of the Robotics Institute Summer Scholar Program. My mentors are Jay Patrikar and Professor Scherer from the Air Lab at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the future of aviation will see a massive increase in low altitude aircraft operation. These fall under general aviation General aviation consists of all non-military, non-commercial civilian flight operation, and they take up the bulk of air traffic in non-controlled airspace. General aviation pilots primarily use visual observation of the path and the other aircraft to detect, sense, and avoid. An increase in the number of flight hours would result in increased conflicts and conflict resolution between pilots as noted by the Federal Aviation Administration, which is the largest transportation agency of the US government and regulates all aspects of civil aviation. In the absence of a centralized traffic controller in the vicinity of general aviation airports, which are common across the country, pilots are expected to follow the FAA guidelines, be socially compliant, maintain separation from each other, as well as take flexible actions. With each aircraft pilot having a specific goal requiring to maintain safety, guiding general aviation aircraft becomes a social navigation problem. 
two main directions have emerged to solve this in recent research. Reinforcement learning is an area of machine learning concerned with how intelligent agents ought to take actions in an environment in order to maximize a reward. Reinforcement learning, however, have a shortcoming when the reward function structure is not well defined. Also, training your aircraft in the real world is difficult and expensive, and using a multi-agent simulator presents the issue of modeling the human-like behavior in the simulator for training the policy, which leads us to our initial problem of defining the reward structure. With an increase in the with an increase in the collection of expert demonstration data, many traditional imitation learning algorithms like behavior cloning or inverse reinforcement learning have been developed that mimic human expert data directly. Learning from expert human demonstration can attempt to provide a natural and human-like motion, and it's now become a popular research direction. This work used the recently released Traj Air dataset, which is collected at the Pittsburgh Butler Regional Airport, a general aviation airport located at Pittsburgh. Here we can observe the aircraft airport traffic pattern of the different aircraft encoded or plotted as circles with their trajectories trailing behind them. We observe the airport traffic pattern, which is a rectangular shaped traffic pattern that ensures the aircraft come into and outside or go out of an airport smoothly. The data set is collected and smooth using a B-spline approximation to get a smoother representation. The next step is to develop a motion primitive library. We model the aircraft as a three-dimensional Euclidean in the three-dimensional Euclidean space to calculate a set of trajectories in the inertial frame. We choose three broad categories of aircraft motion, which is a steady level flight as shown here a steady climb and descent, and coordinated left and right turns. We vary the velocities and the rates of climb and the bank angles over a chosen time horizon to generate our motion primitive library that can be used for generating the next action to be taken for an aircraft. In this work, we use a form of imitation learning known as behavior cloning that learns a policy from expert demonstration data. This network, this model takes as input the past trajectories of all the agents along with the weather context to predict the next action to be taken by the aircraft. We use a temporal convolutional network model that to process the sequential data by breaking down each aircraft trajectories scene by scene of fixed length and encoding them and concatenating them to produce one single action. The selected action from the model is chosen from the motion primitive library and we send it to our agent. The agent performs the uh, selected action and then we collect the trajectory data and an environmental context like the weather data at the given time to complete the loop. Here, we show a simulation result of an action predicted from the network. On the top right, we see the track trajectory that the simulator performs, that is given to the simulator from the network. On the bottom right, we see the dataset trajectory in red and the predicted actions in blue. Here, we command the aircraft to perform a, a right turn, and we see that the aircraft performs the right turn as required. However, it doesn't always work. Here, we show a failure case. We show that the green, you can see the green arrows pointing towards the direction that is opposite to the motion of the agent. Essentially, the model predicted motions that were in a direction that was not meant to be followed by the agent. And thus, we can see that the behavior cloning method requires 
either a large number of demonstrations to cover every single scene action or deviate when encountered with out of distribution states as shown here. We use three metrics to evaluate our model, average displacement error and final displacement error for the trajectories and a cross entropy loss for the selection of motion primitives. Thus, we come to our future work. We want to group similar actions based on each agent's goal to have a group representation of similar actions for each aircraft. We would like to define safety set, that is good and bad action representations as given by our model to train the network better. We would like to collect feedback interactively and provide the human expert full control to intervene when it goes outside safety. As we collect the expert actions, we expect the algorithm to train better on this new policy with significant improvement. We would like to use an interventions from the supervisor during the unsafe situations to learn from it and bring the agent or the aircraft back to safety, update the algorithm and learn. As I conclude, I would like to thank my mentors, Jeff, and Dr. Scherer for guidance and mentorship. Coming to the risk experience, uh, I have ex the risk experience for me was working in a top research lab. I learned about several impressive research topics such as multi-agent robotics, computer vision, reinforcement learning, applied to autonomous aerial vehicles, self-driving cars, and more and we participated in seminars and research talks with experts in different domain of robotics. Personally, I found a very supportive and warm community where everyone connected even when working remotely. We had excellent support and mentorship to conduct research, learned how to communicate our work through a journal article. We had the opportunity to participate in external network, uh, networking and marketing teams and we, got sub we get support for graduate school application preparation. I'd like to thank the risk organizers, Ms. Rachel Burson, Dr. John Dolan, and Ms. Jenny for their support throughout the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, it was a wonderful team that was working with um, Dr. Scherer, I agree with you, absolutely. And your research and the application, we're so excited to see what um, next steps will be there. So thank you so much for sharing your journey and your research with us. I'd like to invite Nikhil Keitha um, to share his research and his risk experience as well. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yep, we can. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Uh... Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nikhil. I'm a robotic enthusiasm scholar at the AI lab, mentored by Dr. Chen and Professor Sebastian Skeller. Um, I'll be presenting our work across the summer air object, an evolving topological graph based object encoding for semantic loop closure. So, you might be wondering why is object encoding important? Object matching is crucial for multi agent robotic tasks involving autonomous exploration, semantic mapping, with downstream applications in search and rescue. Such an object matching requires object encodings which are robust to drastic viewpoint shift, occlusion, and deformation. Another challenging aspect is that as you observe distinct parts of an object, you have unique feature key points corresponding to them. This makes the encoding process really hard because uh, across multiple viewpoints, you have different uh, distinct key points which cannot be matched effectively. Another, another uh, challenging aspect is that these object representations have to be shared and merged across multiple robots efficiently. To enable this intuitively, you can represent an object uh, as a graph where each distinctive feature is represented as a graph node, and you can essentially uh, model the object structure as a graph structure. Here we show that you can represent an object uh, using temporarily varying object representations where these graph structures vary uh, as we progress within the video sequence. So the idea is essentially to build an evolving topological graph representation where you essentially accumulate knowledge across multiple viewpoints. And to enable this, what we do is that we do triangulation on the key points to get an object graph representation. We take this object graph representation and we, we generally match these graphs across multiple frames to build an 
uh, evolving topological graph. And we encode this uh, evolving graph to a trade object descriptor, which can provide robust semantic loop closure. So how do we exactly do this? So for example, let's say you have a, a video sequence of multiple objects. For example, here you have object A, uh, you have a temporal sequence of object A, and you essentially input this to the object encoder to get single term descriptors. And this object encoder is based on GNNs. So what is a GNN? A graph neural network is essentially a deep learning architecture which uses structural context uh, to reason about uh, structure of the data. So how, how it does it that is essentially that you have, for example, let's say you have a graph with three nodes, that is F, D, and E. So essentially you're trying to pass messages from your neighbor states to the current state. And essentially this helps in propagating messages across the whole graph. This structured message passing actually helps in, helps in helps the graph reason about various node features. And the final output being that you have node-wise unique features while also having an object-wise structural context to those features. So with this in mind, so how do we uh, how do we design this object encoder? So essentially we have a node encoder which takes super point key points as input and it encodes these key points uh, to a feature space. And then we use an attention graph that is a two-layered uh, graph attention network uh, based on GNNs to essentially propagate messages based on importance between uh, edits and nodes. And then we use a feature encoder and location encoder to predict node-wise content feature and then uh, node-wise uh, location features. These are element-wise multiplied and uh, input to a single layer encoder to get the object descriptor. So for our particular work, what we do is that we take these location descriptors uh, and then we essentially match them across multiple frames and we build an evolving topological graph using uh, topological graph merging. And using this uh, evolving topological graph structure, we, we rebuild an super point based uh, evolving object graph. And we input that to the object encoder to get a 3D object descriptor, which is uh, robust to semantic loop closure. So to compare the uh, efficacy of our model, we essentially do performance comparison on YouTube video instant segmentation data set, which is essentially an uh, video sequence data set with uh, instant level segmentations. Uh, this data set contains a large uh, object vocabulary with very hard scenarios such as uh, multiple similar animals or people riding on vehicles. Uh, here, essentially, we use two baselines, that is 2D baseline and 3D baseline to compare the performance of our model. And the evaluation criteria is actually that you generate an object descriptor from the first half of the video sequence and you match that with the descriptors from the second half of the video sequence. And here you can see that with uh, single frame object matching, uh, you, you tend to have low, low performance. And also the same case with uh, a naive uh, 3D baseline where you essentially just uh, average single frame descriptors. Our proposed 3D object encoding uh, essentially provides 10 to 15% uh, performance improvements both in recall and F1 score. And also you can see that at varying thresholds when you draw and precision recall curve, uh, you can see that we provide uh, uh, rather large improvements over the 2D baseline. So also as a qualitative analysis, what we do is that we try to analyze um, how the graph merging is happening. That is like, what are the new points added to the evolving graph? So here, what we observed is that as you see drastic viewpoint shift in the object, uh, the, the number of points added to the evolving graph is more, thereby indicating the robustness of the proposed topological graph merging. With that, I would like to conclude, and I would like to thank Dr. Chen, Yu Hang, and Professor Basti for the uh, wonderful guidance across the summer. One more thing regarding uh, what I wanted to present was the RIS experience. RIS is not only about the research, but it's rather also about uh, the community and growing as a scholar. This summer, especially, I learned about a lot of new things in robotics, which, for example, haptics, uh, which my fellow scholar uh, Iki uh, presented about. Uh, I got to learn about a lot of cool things like uh, sp uh, micro, uh, micro robotics, space robotics, et cetera. I got to interact with world renowned researchers and industry experts, uh, for example, from uh, Locomotion, Aurora, et cetera. And, and it was really an uh, eye opening experience. And also, a fun part is that I got to organize this uh, fun interactive series on SLAM at their lab called the uh, Totten SLAM series, and it's still running right now. And uh, I was really, I'm, I'm really grateful to you know, be a part of it. I got to know about grad school opportunities. Um, across the world and also got to network with a lot of people with potential mentors, et cetera. And one more a large aspect of this is essentially the community which you get to 
interact with. So the cohort essentially is a global and inclusive cohort. And then uh, we had peer engagement activities. We had uh, the risk working papers journal and then peer reviewing essentially helped us uh, hone our leadership skills, et cetera. I would like to thank my uh, fellow cohort members for really the awesome summer experience and uh, looking forward to collaborating with them uh, in the future. And to conclude, I would like to thank uh, Rachel, Dr. John, and Jenny for uh, putting together this program and uh, making it a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikhil. And um, you ended on a, a perfect note, which is really with the, the, the community that's there. And, I, and, and um, we've had a lot of questions come in about the Summer Scholar experience, about the Robotics Institute. And I'd like to share out some of those questions. Um, one of them, which I think that you addressed in your presentation is, is the RA Summer Scholar Program only for US students? Absolutely not, RIS is global. So it is anyone in the world that is a current undergraduate student is welcome to apply. And we've hosted students from over 50 different home uh, um, countries. I think that we're probably closer to 70 at this point. So it has always been um, an international program. Some, some questions came in and I wonder if we could, um, if I could ask the scholars to, to share some of your guidance. It's about minimum knowledge needed to participate, but the way I'd like to phrase that question or scaffold it is what are some of the essential background, um, either there were courses or um, open source materials or other things that helped you prepare and succeed in risk, right? So what are some of those um, elements? And Nikhil, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you and then um, any of the other scholars, let's just unmute and we can dive in and, and share um, share your perspectives on that. Um, yeah, sounds great. Uh... I guess that, yeah, like uh, given now, uh, there's like an abundant of material online, I guess on platforms like Coursera, YouTube, uh, many other platforms, like you can really find amazing open source uh, content to read about robotics, deep learning, machine learning. Like uh, I personally, uh, I'm a physics major, so I don't have a lot of uh, computing, like computer programming experience from coursework. So I actually uh, got started with uh, online courses on, uh, online courses and MOOCs. So essentially, I guess that like, I would recommend anyone who wants to get started, you know, just explore. Like if you do a Google search, you, do, you always find a great program uh, from you know, world-known uh, universities and you can essentially uh, start there and you, you slowly start uh, exploring. Wonderful. Um, Balam, Jasmine, Arnab, um, do, you, do you have some ideas that you'd like to, or suggestions that you'd like to add to that? Yes, I'm also with, with Nico. Uh, of course, you can always uh, try to search for new resources out, out of your school, not only with your courses. I'm mechatronics engineering, and that means I'm not fully uh, involved with computer science, computer programming. So what I learned and knew, know about computer programming, I, I learned by uh, extra projects, uh, joining uh, with the research of some uh, of my professors. Um, yeah, I am also uh, encouraging you to, to join some of your brother to reach some of your uh, teachers at your school and they may have some probably some uh, pro uh, interesting project that you may be uh, like comfortable with collaboration with them and then you can get a, a recommendation letter from them so it will be uh, like a dual training. Wonderful, thank you, Balam. That really resonates is that at your home university, there are opportunities. It may be, your major may be robotics. It may be a little bit different. It may be inclusive like mechatronics or physics. Starting with your home university and some of those opportunities that are there is a great way to get started. Um, Jasmine, do you, Arnab, do you have some quite, um, suggestions or, or guidance that you'd like to share? Yeah, I could go. Uh, I personally believe that uh, we could uh, uh, look at opportunities like student competitions or if there's any student group that's in your university, maybe there's a range of students from different years that are participating and uh, join them in different projects apart from professors. And if, if it's possible, maybe look around to neighboring universities in your locality or near, near your home's uh, location so that you can like get better or 
a wider experience working in research projects if you don't have sufficient research uh, mentors at your home university. Absolutely, those are great suggestions. Thank you, Jasmine. Arnab? Yeah, I just want to quickly add that because robotics is such a diverse field, there are a lot of things that you could potentially uh, learn about. And so, for example, I guess I'm in a boat similar to most of my fellow scholars here where I'm a biomedical engineering major. So my coursework does not really help me with computation and coding. Uh, what did help, I will say, is that Professor Andrew Ng has a lot of uh, nice lectures online in YouTube, Coursera, I think, about machine learning. And so because my research was a lot about machine learning, I found that very helpful. If you're very passionate about some other topic in robotics, there's definitely some resource out there for you to look at, and it's most likely free as well. So you can definitely explore on your own. And Jasmine mentioned a great point about getting involved uh, outside your coursework with competitions or research, et cetera. So yeah, whatever you're passionate about, there's definitely something out there for you to get better at it. Yeah. Thank you for, for, for sharing that guidance. And when we think about you know, applying, if someone's not a robotics major or a CS major, that shouldn't be a barrier. So if we look across the cohort, we have 58 students from 14 countries and different backgrounds, different opportunities. Um, um, you know, so really look at a lot of those open source materials. Your home university has amazing things that you can do, right? And going outside in Jasmine, that was, that was a great suggestion. Not just your home university, but what else is there? What kinds of competitions? Are there clubs? Are there other resources that you can really explore there? For, there, there were a couple questions about um, learning more specifically about the air lab. There is amazing work there. So I'm going to share screen for a moment. And while I do that, um, I wonder if you would share with one of the scholars, because there's a lot of information, there's about 20 to 25 labs that participate. If, if I'm interested in learning more about a lab, how, how do you suggest that I do that? So, um, I, I turn it back over to you and I'm just going to share one resource, um, visually with, with, with folks as well while you're doing that. I would recommend like, um, you know, going to the posters, like that's how I got started. Like, uh, you know, start by explaining the posters and then go check out the journal papers. You can get an idea of like, what did they work on? And then uh, if possible, reach out to the mentors. If, uh, you know, it's just like, you can just try uh, reaching out or you can try reading more about that topic and, you know, uh, mention interest in the SOP. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah. You know, a great way to get started is exactly as Nikhil, Nikhil said, there's, there's the, the, the posters, there's the videos, there's, there's the journal articles, and you get to see the breadth of the research that's happening. There's a lot going on, for example, in the air lab. It's a huge lab. There's a lot of different application areas. Um, and um, we're going to continue to add to this. If um, so, the website has a lot of resources here um, for for students to 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 explore and to see. Here's a hard question, right? That that I wonder if we could ask. To, I think we've provided some guidance on this already. Is it necessary to have research experience prior to RIS, right? And what I already heard is that there are many different pathways, right? There are many different pathways. Um, I, I would say it is not um, required to have research experience, having project experience. And I would turn that around and say, what kind of projects have you done? Um, are you able to work um, and extend that project with um, the faculty member? What are some other opportunities for folks to prepare for research if maybe they don't have research experience or it's just not a possibility at their home university? What are some suggestions? Um, one thing I would suggest is um, like, it, like data science platforms, like they do provide some amazing challenges and like um, these days, even with workshops, like you find uh, amazing competitions, like just for people who want to get started. So I would recommend that these are like places where you can stand out and, you know, these can help you potentially get collaborations or reach out to people, show, show your worth and then um, really get some mentorship opportunities. So um, yeah, I would recommend trying to do any kind of project, like a hackathon or like 
any kind of uh, student competition as Jasmine mentioned. So like uh, whatever opportunity comes your way, just take it and you know give it a try. So nothing wrong in doing that. Anything others? Um, Thank you, Jasmine. I'd like to add that uh, if there is no prior research experience and it's not possible, then it would be probably best to go through the topics that you're interested in and maybe try to do something on your own, maybe implement a very basic level structure and that way get hands on on the topic, which might help you get noticed by the author of the work and then make you get a good connection with the creator of the work and thereby establish your uh, connection. Those are great suggestions. Those are great. And, and it is about establishing that connection to the work, to the lab. And there are so many ways that, um, that we as a university, the different labs, um, Nikhil mentioned the Tartan Slam, um, the scholars themselves, they've been reaching out, sharing that so that there are a lot of resources out there to explore um, as starting points for whatever your learning style is, however you wanna consume the materials. There are tons of materials out there to take a look at. So, so that's great. Any other um, suggestions or inclusion before we go on to um, the, mm -hmm. the next question? Okay, and, I, and just in the interest of, of, of time, um, the question that I'll um, pose to, to all of you is why choose CMU? Why choose um, CMU? Why is that, um, you know, why did you choose that, right? Um, yeah, I guess I've seen a question um, based on that, yeah, like, uh... Given CMU is very selective, why, why should one select CMU? I would say it's uh, because it, it's so selective. Like the reason it's selective is that you have such an amazing uh, peer, like not, not just mentors, but you also have your peer who are like um, well-rounded or like, for example, let's say I don't know anything about how that I can just go uh, ask someone else about it. And like that community is really important. And uh, I would say CMU has the best community in terms of uh, robotics or artificial intelligence. Like, um, you can reach out to anyone, like even just like professors or uh, grad students, and you you know you always find someone working on something which is important in the field of robotics. So that community is essentially very important, and I would say that that kind of community helps you really grow as a um, grow as a researcher. Yeah, I also want to just. Oh, sorry, Rachel. Oh no, no, I was just thanking Nikhil. Please, I know. Um, I just want to quickly add that not only are you choosing CMU, but you're also choosing the people at CMU. So a lot of the times CMU, like you, the research that you will enjoy will be at those institutions that are like Nikhil is mentioning, like uh, so selective and world-class and cutting edge, like that's where all the interesting research is going on. So not only are you choosing CMU, but also the type of research that you want to do might just be at CMU. And so I just thought I would share that. That's true. There's such breath, right? There's such breath. Jasmine, um, what would you like to add? Yes, uh, building upon Nichols' point, the community, the research community is so diverse at CMU that even like you want help from any topic, you can approach the grad students or even pro professors in the different labs. So there is always a chance to explore new topics and topics that you haven't even heard before. And that opportunity that is provided by RI at CMU is the reason why I think we should go for CMU RIS program. Thank you. That, that's true, that's true. Balan? Yeah, it's sort a little bit, of course. Uh, if you decide to go for CMU, you know that you are going to be um, surrounded by people that also like research. If you, if you like research, uh, you don't know that the peer, the cohort members, the, all of the people around CMU also like research and that you are going to be exchanging ideas and that, uh, you know, nobody's going to be like annoying and just like seeing you like, do you really like research? No, because all of you like research and so you are in a good community to learn, to exchange ideas and to, you know, it, it, Another important part is that you are going to be uh, in a community that is uh, multidisciplinary, not just like in, with a, a sad background, but also like 
some people are going to be international students, some people are going to be like me from Mexico, from India, from another country, and you're going to be exchanging ideas with those people that have a different background that you may have, and that will not be useful for you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, and I, I, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and and wrap up here. Um, some wonderful ideas have been shared, and I always like to hear through the eyes of the of the scholar what that experience was and and how you grow and learn. And um, Jasmine, that idea of you talked about is this learning community, like it's a sandbox, right? And and Kiel and Vodam, you're saying any of those topics and the people as well, they may be here at Carnegie Mellon and there's a lot of opportunities to immerse in it. But I think even more important is to choose research, choose that and, and, and explore um, some of those opportunities at your home university, um, join a, a hackathon, join a competition, um, uh, explore some online courses. There's a lot of opportunity and it just keeps growing in both robotics and AI, those online resources and the community here is one in which we want to give opportunities to students around the world. And that's why we've created RIS and, and, and we're supporting it um, to try to give people an opportunity to connect and grow. Um, so if you are an undergraduate student, um, we hope that you'll use also our website to explore some of these topics in, in, in robotics and, and see what the faculty and other are doing. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. This has been a joy to hear through the eyes of the scholars, their experience, and um, we look forward to continuing these conversations. <laughs>